Good afternoon, everyone. There are a few seats left. Uh, otherwise, obviously, we have uh, standing room, so that's nice to see. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience if you don't have a seat. Uh, welcome to the new semester and to our PEI uh, faculty seminar series. My name is Mike Celia. I'm director of the Environmental Institute, and it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you back. Uh, just as a reminder, we have these faculty uh, seminars typically the first Tuesday of each month. That will be the case for the spring semester as well. And our upcoming seminars will be by Emmanuel Kreitke from the History Department, Michael Bender from Geosciences, and Denise Mazarell from the uh, Woodrow Wilson School and CEE Department. <clears throat> You'll all get uh, notices about them as the time comes. But today, uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce Rob Sokolow, who is our uh, faculty speaker for today. Rob has uh, all of his degrees in physics from a place called Harvard, uh, up the road. He came to Princeton um, in 1971 to join what is now mechanical and aerospace engineering, um, but also, sort of equally importantly, at that time, he joined a new center on campus, which was the Center for Environmental Studies. Um, a few years after, he became director of that center. And then a few years after that, it changed its name to the Center for Energy and Environmental Studies uh, and continued on until 1998, when it was merged in with uh, the Princeton Environmental Institute, PEI, when Rob became uh, uh, a, a part of PEI, more so than he was uh, uh, before. Um, and within PEI, uh, Rob has had an enormous footprint. Uh, I'll mention just a few things. Uh, he is co-director, uh, along with Steve Pakala, of the Carbon Mitigation Initiative, which began in the year 2000. Um, it has had a tremendous impact, both on the campus and off. It is by far the largest uh, industry-funded project in the history of this university. Um, and I could go on probably for 20 minutes about that, but I won't. Um, <clears throat> uh, Rob also uh, is co-organizer of the Climate Futures Initiative, which integrates across the humanities as well as the natural sciences. Uh, he is, uh, continues to be the head of the Princeton Energy and Climate Scholars Program, an important program for our graduate students. Uh, he's involved in many other things in, in PEI uh, and, and has been uh, extremely important in terms of contributions. More broadly, in terms of awards, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he is a lifetime national associate of the National Academy, which is, quote, in recognition of extraordinary service to the National Academies. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, among many awards, which is the quote that I sort of like the best, um, is uh, an award he got from the uh, American Physical Society, the Leo Seisland Award. And it is for leadership in establishing energy and environmental problems as legitimate research fields for physicists. <laughs> and for demonstrating that these broadly defined problems can be addressed with the highest scientific standards. So with that, please join me in welcoming Rob. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone. I like that quote too. Um, and thank you, Mike, for this introduction and for continuing the uh, faculty seminar series that Francois began. I am your first Celia faculty speaker, and it's an honor indeed to, to be that. It's great to have Mike at the helm of PEI. I have a lot, of, I have a lot to cover, and I'm going to go quite fast. The subject is how we think about the future. We are looking at graph after graph of this sort where something is on the y-axis. Present time is often somewhere in the middle. If you're a historian, it's off to the right. If you're a futurist, it's off to the left. But for many of us, it's, it's, it's part of the middle. And destiny studies is a word I'm using for the systematic study of our collective future, including how we think about it. It has the potential. I have two objectives, really, in trying to, in this talk, and where it go, where, wherever it leads. One is to 
confront the toxic nature of our political conversation and the other to the muted nature of our academic conversation, where we just, there is a lot we don't say to each other uh, that has to do with our concerns about the subject. This is a slide I'm not going to spend any time explaining except to say that it was the first slide I showed in a course I taught this fall to a freshman seminar where the student's objective was to write about some subject for the whole term and, and write a capsule, a time capsule, to put into the, uh, put away and then to open it on four occasions or at the graduation, at uh, their 10th, their 25th, and their 50th reunions. The 25th is in orange here because it is also that same year, 2046, the 300th reunion of the university, 300th anniversary of the university. It will be a big deal, and they will be there for that. Um, there were six undergraduates, six freshmen. They're here at Mud Library with Dan Linke, the Mud Library librarian. They we're looking at some 18th century Princeton undergraduates journal. The capsules are now there. Um, come around in 20. 21 for sure, and then onward from there, depending on who's in the room, for as many as you can, and make a big party. Um, so that experience, they, they wrote about a whole variety of papers, and they had the assignment of describing not their favorite outcome, but two alternative outcomes uh, that were very different from each other. They could then take sides, but they have to accept the contingency of the problem. And they interviewed a lot of people. One of my favorites is the student who got involved with his bishop when he tried, when he and the two of them tried to understand how the Catholic Church would deal with geoengineering. A really important problem, actually. So I'm going to talk first about the climate change problem, then about the solutions. And the climate change problem, the high level messages are, again, not many of these are very familiar to you. I hope there's enough new things in this talk that you won't say you've heard it all before. But doing ordinary things, we are changing the planet. Because our climate science is so unsettled, the best and worst outcomes of what we are doing are dramatically different. This is in contrast to the frequently made statement that the science is settled. And high carbon industrialization in the developing countries is problem number one. So what does it mean to say the planet is small? We have, through climate science, an approximate connection between how much carbon dioxide we emit and how much the temperature of the planet is getting warmer. The bigger the planet, the slower that would happen. Uh, we have one degree temperature rise already, and approximately 1,600 billion tons of CO2 have been emitted by burning fossil fuels. There's a lot of simplifications. Many of you know what shortcuts I'm taking. It's approximately linear, which means that if we do as much emission uh, again, we'll have a two degree temperature rise. And two degrees Celsius temperature rise is the international climate target. Um, another equivalent emissions would be at three degrees. The, um, we wish the Earth were larger. The ordinary things I have in mind are things like eating hamburgers, commuting to work, building with concrete, and going skiing. These are the things, the modern world's activities, uh, that are the challenge. To take a, a geometric representation of, those of the two degree and the three degree option, if, you have it, if you're going to emit as much again and then be done as you have already, well, why not go back down the same way you went up in the isosceles triangle over there? That essentially is the assignment the world has set itself to the extent that the, the, that assignment is to have a two degree temperature rise. If you go out 40 years, you have half, half the fossil fuel emissions of today. And that is a, a, a shorthand for what the objective is that's being formulated. If you relax, and try to go one degree, allow yourself one extra degree, which is deeply resisted by the uh, world at the present time, you, have, you slot in 40 extra years of today's emissions. Emissions today are about 40 billion tons of CO2 a year. 40 by 40 is 1,600. Those triangles are also 1,600. I have a little memoriam here at Ken DeFaze, who has worked in this building and was a, a very famous guy as a professor of geosciences, died last week. He was the person who uh, called attention to the uh, amounts of fossil fuel available in the world. And I've added this, these little yellow triangles to say we are heading up. We haven't turned around, uh, turned uh, that angle very much yet. Um, and if we didn't care about climate change, we would stay going up. 
we have lots more fossil fuel than we will be able to burn for either a two or a three degree Celsius uh, goal. And I ask myself, suppose we didn't know about carbon dioxide. We hadn't taken the, we hadn't, the science hadn't advanced enough. A few intrepid scientists hadn't been inter become interested in the problem. Would we actually know today that we were doing something to the climate? We're just about at the point where we, where we probably would, but I can imagine a world where we have not figured that out and we are going blithely along. So in such a sense, that's homage to the climate scientists who have brought this problem forward and brought us uh, a consciousness of it. I sometimes say that there are three complementary aspects of this problem as we confront it. One is that we have figured out that we're in trouble. Two is that we have real options to take care of it. And three, we give a damn. If you take any one of those three out, you get an interesting world that is not ours. We have, we have therefore, the budget concept. We cannot begin to, uh, we, we must leave lots of carbon in the ground that, we would, that are, is attractive as fossil fuel. And we have, to, we have an allocation issue which is totally unfamiliar. We will have better options someday. It doesn't matter when you talk about cumulative emissions. That's the reason it's an interesting concept. Whether we put out, we burn coal in 2030 or 2060, approximately the same climate consequences follow. Whose, whose fossil fuel are we going to take out of the ground and whose are we going to leave behind? And where will we use it? And for what purposes? And then there's one technical uh, cute point here that, that the carbon comes out of the ground with hydrogen attached. The hydrogen burns and gives you energy without any carbon, in the, any carbon dioxide. So the more hydrogen you can take out of the ground with the carbon, the better off you are. Fossil energy takes different, has different hydrogen to carbon ratios depending on which fossil energy you look at. Natural gas has four hydrogens with a carbon, coal a little less than one. So that argument by itself tends to favor going after uh, building your economy on natural gas rather than coal to the extent that you have to use one or the other. And again, these are judgments that have no precedent. And these sentences in green are my truths. Um, the third point related to this high level description of the problem is we have a lot of, un, a lot of incompleteness to our current science. I've tried to turn that into a quantitative statement using the fourth assessment report. Um, and it's basically that doubling of the carbon dioxide emissions is approximately letting the concentration go to 560 part per million from its pre-industrial 280 value. Would get you to three degrees C, say the climate scientists, as best they can tell, but one sixth chance it would be two degrees. You'd get away with the target you're looking for while going way higher in the, in the concentration than you, uh, than you thought you would be able to do. That's called being lucky. The reverse is also true. We could be working extremely hard for two degrees and still get three with about a one sixth chance, three or more. And so that's being unlucky. Now I, I wanna emphasize this because of a a conversation that made more imp impression on me perhaps than it should have, but I was talking to one of the senior scientists in this field about 10 years ago, making this very point and saying we could be lucky. And that scientist replied, you must never say that. You must never say that, meaning somehow that part of the obligation of the science community is to motivate people toward action. And if you say you could be lucky, it would somehow diffuse that. To me, when you say you could be lucky, there's a three dots after it when you catch your breath, or we could be unlucky. And I think that's the major point. We could be unlucky, deeply unlucky. We have a very limit, a very inadequate um, effort to understand, at least to my mind, the priorities are wrong in the climate science world in emphasizing so much the uh, central estimates and not designing research programs, um, field programs, model modeling programs to go after the question, how unlucky could we be consistent with today's science and how can we either shrink that or give ourselves early warning that that's the planet we actually live on. The, the working group, uh, the most recent assessment report, uh, makes it even more clear, and the wording is there, that we really don't know about the, what are called the tails, the high tails. So I've asterisked uh, those truths that I think are super important for you to walk away from here with. This is one of them. Risk management demands an, a global climate science effort that gives greater priority to extreme outcomes. I hope we can find ways to talk about that. Um, an example of where this uncertainty uh, hobbles us is in the, these four maps of Florida with one, two, four, and eight meters of sea level rise, one meter. Um, 
at the end of the century is kind of a reference point. People think we won't have it that bad if we're, but again, if we're lucky, it won't be a full meter. If we're unlucky, it could be, uh, people even talk of two meters. If you're a planner in, in Miami now, what is this? How do you come to terms with all of this? The second part of the description of the problem is the critical importance of the developing world. And I've been involved with two efforts to try to come to get quantita a quantitative feel for that. The first with Steve Davis at Irvine a few years ago, we, in we introduced the concept of committed emissions. And if you look at the upper left picture, there's two ways. You build a power plant, it goes online, and there are two ways of thinking about, what's about that. One, it will emit, em it will emit uh, carbon dioxide for quite a few years and you allocate those emissions to the to year in which the emission occurs. The other is to say, you're going to emit those, that carbon dioxide, put it all into the year you put the thing online, charge the whole commitment to the year you made that commitment. It's like buying a, a mortgage. The whole event happens at that time. And then if a few years later, you've emit, some of that emission has happened and some of it is left, we'll differentiate the two, talk about realized emissions and remaining commitments. So in 2012, looking back at the power plants that had been built in the previous years that were either running or had been closed down, the top picture is the mirror image of the bottom picture, and the bottom picture discriminates what's already been emitted and is over with, and what's left to emit with an additional assumption that plants will run 40 years. They close down earlier, you take something away. If they keep going, you keep adding to it, and you get a number, 300 billion tons of CO2 left to emit from the world's power plants as of that year. Do that for a variety of years, and you discover that that number year after year has been going up. Um, it's 300, 300 there at the top of the picture. It's allocated, so at that time, not at that time in 12, 2012, half of the emissions are from China's coal plants left to, because they're young. The US contribution was larger if you'd taken that poll in the 1990s when the US plants were younger and there were not many Chinese coal plants. And as far as the fuel is concerned, coal dominates gas, which dominates oil on the right-hand side. Um, I wanted to update that curve. I thought I would see that the number might not have been going up as fast in the last few years. We've been getting a kind of positive feeling about the climate problem. Alas, uh, uh, Dan, Dan um, Tong, uh, working in China now, but Steve Davis is postdoc, has just updated it. It's, I'm calling it preliminary because I, I want to make sure we've gone over it a couple of times. The number is 355. It's been going up at 4% per year and it hasn't stopped. The world is developing on the backs of coal and sometimes gas power plants, building them far faster than they're being retired. We are not in any, by any means out of the woods. And secondarily, most of the, those electrons for the most part end up inside buildings, running, running heating and ventilating and air conditioning equipment, computers, lights, refrigerators and so forth. And we build like this all over the developing world. We means we, human, we, we humans, we earthlings. These are, our, these are our apartment buildings all over the world, built fast uh, and, and creating a tremendous pent up uh, uh, demand for future, for future emissions. So the committed emissions concept catches the buildings also. How much time are we spending thinking about this issue? which is dominating the built-in emissions, current emissions and built-in emissions. Not a whole lot. I found this picture just on the way to China a couple of years ago because I was worried about the translators would be able to translate LeapFrog. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it used to be that it was a very radical concept. Uh, the developing countries didn't want to be guinea pigs. It isn't radical anymore. Over and over again, things are happening in the developing world first. But we're not paying anywhere near the attention we could be of how to be helpful and how not to get in the way. China, for example, is building long distance uh, transmission lines. And I really think the statement is true, although it's politically uh, uh, loaded, uh, the developing world will decide what kind of planet we live on. If they don't care about climate change, it really won't matter much whether we do. And conversely, if they really do care about climate change, it won't matter a whole lot whether we do. They will have most of the emissions in the world, most of the technologies to deal with it. So another, an, another exercise, just mentioning very briefly, uh, with, with uh, Massimo Tavoni and Shoibal Chakravarti and Pakala was part of this, was to try to say how much do individuals emit, not talking about countries anymore, 
um, and broke the world into all of its people, seven billion people, each responsible for a certain amount of emissions, using income data to try to do that. And then realizing that the world average today is about five tons of carbon dioxide per year. An American's about 15, used to be 20. We've actually come down. Uh, India's around two, and, um, or even less. And bin, that, bin those people after you figure out where they, where they, uh, how, what the distribution looks like. And there's about a billion people on the planet emitting more than 10 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Nearly all Americans, a good fraction of Europeans, and increasing numbers of people from the developing world. Um, the, the, the emissions are on the, the, the numbers of people are on the left, the emissions are on the right. You see that this large, more than half are com of the emissions are coming from this relatively small group of people who are the quote high emitters. 10 tons of CO2 is the average for Europe. So we're not talking about rich people, we're talking about high emitters who are middle class, includes all the rich people, but the great majority of them are people who are in, in the income level of, a, of an average European or just below an average American. And they are living more and more in the developing world. So for two different time periods, 23 and 2030, you see um, a change in the distribution. China is the green. I think this is somewhat out of date in the sense that I think the purple is probably going to be wider than it is there because India and other countries are developing. That was not so much in the models at the time. But by, by 2030, by the models estimates of how the world is likely to develop, more than half of the emitters above 10 tons of CO2 per year will be in the developing world, and they will nonetheless be responsible, and they, they will, and all of us will be responsible for more than half of the emissions in the world. I could turn to the poverty dimension of this subject. I'm not gonna have time to. The shorthand though is the poverty emissions are very, very small. We can make poor people, get, bring them off the lowest level of the, of the ladder and meet Millennium Development Goals and not make a dent on global climate change obligations. It'd be just a very small change. So it's about our big emitters, it's about leapfrogging, it's about buildings. I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Um, so we turn to solutions. Um, again, high level messages, what do we not understand? What might we pay more attention to? One of the very interesting questions is when do you declare a winner when you have a competition? And the second is that many of the solutions to climate change are truly dangerous. Those are the two points I wanna make. So Steve Pakala and I wrote a paper called Stabilization Wedges, uh, 2004, now almost 14 years ago. And I've, first time I've shown this slide and the one after, I've been trying to say, what do I, what do I think about that paper today? And, um, and it really was in our minds that we didn't have, we were agnostic about the promise of a variety of alternative ways of achieving a low carbon economy equivalent of being at the starting gate. Just, the starting gates have just opened. A lot of horses are going to run for the op opportunity to be the, the ones who bring a low carbon ec economy on board. And they were, they were lined like this. 2018, who's in front? Anybody want to nominate a horse for the uh, technology for, for one of the front horses? Surely. Wind, okay, anyone else? Solar. solar, wind and solar, I agree. Um, <laughs> and uh, they have raced ahead. The story of the last 14 years of wind and solar is spectacular. There are 100 times more solar, the solar capacity, solar panel capacity in the world is 100 times what it was when we wrote that paper in 14 years. Wind is 15 times higher. We started with a higher base, it's just, they're, and it's still ahead, but it's, it's three versus 300 gigawatts for solar and 40 versus 500 gigawatts for wind. Enormous growth. That guy in the back, we were very interested in hydrogen in those days. Um, I think it's gone nowhere, and I think it's gone nowhere for a reason that was really our blind spot, because it was around. We, di we, didn't, we didn't think batteries were going to become important. So we thought we wouldn't be able to get away with a, a zero carbon, a secondary fuel unless we had hydrogen. And so hydrogen fuel cell cars and whatnot were our preference. The battery was, had had a very rough time over the previous couple of decades. Uh, but, but the Toyota Prius, which I think I didn't, may not even have known about in 2004, began, began to be sold just a couple of years later but was in US, but was already out there. 
shook a lot of people up. Hey, the battery really can move forward, and it has ever since. And I think that's why hydrogen, which is a dangerous fuel, which it does the same things as electricity, maybe it has a role in storage, but it's way back there. The surprise was, this, to me anyway, was the two important technologies, carbon capture and storage and nuclear power, have done very poorly. Uh, nothing like the promise we thought they had at that time. Um, what's the major difference between wind and solar on the one hand and carbon capture and storage and nuclear on the other? At one level, it's the size of the elemental unit of activity. Solar panel is produced billions of times. The wind turbine <coughs> is many times. Carbon capture and storage and nuclear come in big gulps, like this one. <laughs> and uh, so they've had to be justified one unit at a time. The cost overruns in both are fearsome. Uh, there was public opposition across both of them, and that's the other major discriminating variable. Wind and solar are popular. Carbon capture and storage and nuclear are not. And in 14 years, at least this is my view. I mean, people didn't start where I started. They wouldn't be there. This is at least my own personal journey. Um, gas for coal uh, is what's going on right now all over the world. Uh, also becoming far more important than we imagined, which leading to an election of an American president um, and a few other things. Uh, and then keep going. The efficient coal plant has been another very positive story. If you, the coal plants that are being sold today by China around Asia are a lot more efficient than they were in 24. End use efficiency has stayed important, but not at the front of the pack. We're not really zeroing in, as those office buildings showed a moment ago. Biological, which means forests and soils, is, is still in the conversation. And I owe Greta Shum this, these films and she said, these pictures, and she said, I'm adding storage. I said, you're right, there were only 15 horses in our first paper, and this one wasn't on the list, but there's something called, something called the dark horse. There were more than 15 horses in that first picture, so here's storage, very important, and coming on very strong. What kinds of questions does this apply to? It applies, for example, to an issue we're going to be very prominent in the United States, of what are we going to run our own power plants on, and when are we going to replace the ones we have? This picture, these are just the U.S. plants, and more than half of them are more than 40 years old, coal and nuclear all coming to an end. There was an announcement yesterday that one of the coal plants, one of the nuclear plants in New Jersey, Oyster Creek, we shut down a year earlier than intended, says its owner, Exelon. We're getting this whole period of turnover, but to what? When, when Germany faced that, they, they've actually been going to back to coal. Um, what are we going to be building? Are we various things ready? What about wind and solar? <coughs> I'm just gonna show you one slide. This is the newest thing I've been doing. Uh, with the help of Pedro Haro, a postdoc here on his way to a faculty job in Spain. He um, said, well, let's look at a year of, he had a year of data of, from, of, of wind output, wind power output for Texas, essentially ERCOT, which is the power system of Texas. I said, what are the longest periods that didn't have some amount of, that were low power? Defined for the sake of argument, low power to be, <coughs> excuse me, to be half, below half the average of the year and then order the, the, go find the longest time periods. I don't think people have been looking at, at intermittent data like that. I'm sure some people do. There was one 96-hour period, 97-hour period, and two in the 40s, three in the 40s. So these are the events that are going to be the challenge, not the one-hour one periods, but these longer ones are the real challenge of wind power. Um, what are they about? What happened in those days? I, took the, I had the working assumption that these were low wind periods, reasonable, but only one of the four, D, is a low wind period. The other seemed to be reason for, for some reason, maybe, maybe it was a very stormy time and the wind turbines uh, feathered their blades and rode them out. Uh, maybe there was something else. So, so low, low output analysis, I think, is going to be a new kind of analysis. It's part of one of the many ways in which we have to think differently. If solar and wind is going to we're going to swap our current energy system for solar and wind. We're dealing with all kinds of issues about how fast that could happen. And, I'm, and a, a program that's getting underway here at Princeton, led by Chris Grieg from Australia, who's going to Queensland, who's going to spend two years with us, is called Rapid Switch. It asks the questions, how fast can anything change? It's a deep and important question. The acceleration rather than the velocity. We don't tend to spend much time on this. The literature of modeling is very casual about it. 
What can we learn in general rules from fashion, from all kinds of other ways in which things change? Uh, littering and foot binding and all kinds of issues are being brought forward as this changed, how fast did it change, why did it change? We're dealing with questions of that sort. Um, and what goes wrong when we attempt, when we try to change things too quickly? So leading into this final set of uh, ideas I want to put forward is that we have a real problem if we get, if we make the problem of climate change too important. I know people will say to me, we haven't got anywhere near important enough, how can you talk this way? But I am concerned that we, and I think we will get a more honest conversation if we talk about the, uh, the, the possibilities and ask whether we want them to happen. So I put, I've separated three, nuclear power, biocarbon, and geoengineering, which all of which worry me, especially from clean coal, which is carbon capture and storage, wind and solar, and conservation, all of which have their own problems. Um, and uh, say that the critical word is conditionality. Whenever we go to a solution, we cannot be just completely um, innocently welcoming it. Um, and ways of saying that, it is possible to achieve two degrees C and regret doing so. I have had conversations where people, I've asked people, can you imagine getting to two degrees and regretting doing so? And they think for half a minute, they say no. I think it's a failure of imagination there. I call it two-sided reasoning, which weighs both the threat and its solution. So let's start with nuclear power, which it, I'm a physicist. I grew up, I guess the task that my group at, at 50 years ago, even 60 years ago, we can, can we keep the world from nuclear war? That was the number one challenge to a generation of scientists. That is my cohort. Um, and we are getting more and more casual about nuclear weapons. In the last week or two, the most recent statements out of Washington are just utterly terrifying in terms of the, the sort of the acceptability. Let me recommend a book to you all called, by Dan Ellsberg called Doomsday Machine about, about well, it just came out in the last few months. So he's on a book tour. He'll come here probably. Uh, nuclear weapons have become more desired. There is a link between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. We tend to hide it from ourselves. It comes by way of enriched uranium. It comes by way of plutonium. And we, so conversation in, in Beijing with a leading climate modeler, uh, climate negotiator. Um, and I, I said, you're, and they, they make it clear, they're counting on nuclear power in China to meet their low carbon targets. I say to him, you're going to export uh, nuclear power too, I suppose. He said, oh yes. I said, like where? He said, like Saudi Arabia. I say, why does Saudi Arabia need nuclear power? He says, for climate change. So I can imagine all too easily that the, a, a nuclear war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and my bottom line there is a nuclear war is a poor trade for the slowing of climate change. And we don't like to go there. I think we must go there in terms of this kind of issue. For biocarbon, this little, walk, me, walk through this exercise with, with me and I will read this time. What will, be go, what will go wrong if we move headlong to maximize global biocarbon stocks? They could be either in soils or forests. And you've got a world where carbon price is very high and you're told that you're storing carbon is your only objective. What would you do? Would you establish a monocrop? Would you use fertilizer? Be as inventive as you can. Your goal is to please the boss. Get this carbon up. Now flip rolls and you're the policymaker who is concerned about damage to the ecosystems. What conditionalities would you place on the carbon market so that the actions of the person who, you are, who is working for you would actually be positive in your mind? What do you have to limit, how do you have to limit the option in order for it not to go haywire? Third of those three horsemen, for me, a different kind of horsemen, are the geoengineering, geoengineering, geoengineering prospects. I think some of you may still be unfamiliar with this idea, although it's getting more and more attention that we would imitate volcanoes. The Pinatubo uh, explosion in June of 1991 cooled the planet for a whole year uh, by a degree or so, half a degree. And then the, the particles that were shot into the stratosphere by that volcano settled out and the temperature went back to where it was. If there had been a perpetual volcano, we could have a cooler planet. You can create a, a perpetual volcano by engineering the planet by putting particles on purpose through balloons or rockets or, or, or special aircraft into the stratosphere and keep doing it year after year after year and tune the amount and get the amount of cooling on the planet that you would like and that is called geoengineering or solar radiation management 
and it's on the list of ways of dealing with global warming. So imagine a fully engineered planet, a fateful choice that is on the radar screen. One of my six students wrote about it. There may be no way back. There's no obvious political process that will reconcile contending goals. How, how warm do you want it here? How warm do you want it there? And I, the one I'm going to bring up, because I never, never see it, is we, if we're in charge, we'll be, we'll be looking after our own, our own objectives, which are comfort and, and uh, not extreme, not extreme of no, no storms or fewer storms. The lots of the species on this planet depend on those extreme events for their ecological niches and for their survival. We're not likely to pay attention to them, so beware of using geoengineering to remove highs and lows. It'll eradicate the evolutionary niches of countless species. A conversation, again, we've got lots of ecology students in the room. I'd love to know whether that's something we really should be worrying about. My summary of this whole thing is that Hippocrates had it right. A modern version of this was, I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. Imagine, many of you have been in the situation where somebody is very sick and a doctor and the patient, and perhaps you are discussing whether to use a very se severe drug or not. Many of the issues of climate change, unfortunately, are like that. And my last lesson or truth, the lowest conceivable greenhouse tar targets achievable only by casting caution to the winds are not optimal. You do not hear that very often. I think we need to say it. I think it is a truth. Here are my 12 truths. We don't have time to go through them. I'd rather have a question, period. But can such points of departure, and many comparable ones, enable a more constructive conversation about climate change, which, as I said, is my objective. So finally, an acknowledgment. Acknowledgments, it's all about Princeton. It's a fantastic place to work. I want to call out its values, not that I exemplify them, but that they are here. Rigor, engagement, independence, global reach, collegiality, irreverence, and moral compass. I want to call out Pac Steve Pacala, Bob Williams, and Frank von Hippel, only Steve is here, as the mentors of mine and colleagues of mine over the whole time that I've been here, and many more. I want to call out my four homes, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, this Princeton Environmental Institute, the Anlinger Center, and the Woodrow Wilson School STEP program. It's young people who really make us, keep us going, undergrads, grad students, and postdocs. They replenish the spirit. Their sentence is, it's up to us, and they take the baton, what will be in their talks in 2068. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, it's a great talk. Uh, before we take questions, can I, I some of you will, will be starting to leave. If you brought something in with you, like a plate or a cup or a bottle, please carry it out with you so we don't have to clean up after you. Thank you. Now we're open for questions. In the back. Yeah, we get you, get your mic. Uh, it's impossible. Just, just speak okay. loudly. Go ahead. We can't all we can't all have a steak dinner once every every day. I mean, well, there are many. I mean, I, I'd have to see the details of why we can't have secondary education for everyone. I we're practically there. I mean, it seems bizarre, but that we you can state things and with tech, today's technologies, not all seven billion people can do X. My example is they can't all visit the pyramids. They can't all visit the pyramids, and they all want to go to the pyramids. Maybe there is an IT solution to seeing the, the pyramid. Here's why I'm smiling, because I've given talks like this for a lot of years, and if I don't mention, there will be a question toward the, in the Q&A period, how come you didn't mention, and before that sentence is finished, I know the rest of the sentence, which is population. I didn't put it in, I could have. To my mind, 
Uh, there, uh, I could say a lot of things. Where, where do I start? There is no reason why the world population can't keep going down after it peaks. On basis, without war and pestilence, with family decisions to have one to two children each, uh, gliding down back to a population of two billion, I'd say in 2200, we, have no, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We are afraid of that. Country after country wants to have a pro-natalist policy so it doesn't run out of Italians or whoever's. And, and, uh, but part of this view of the world is, yes, it would be better if there were fewer people, and we, were all, and we did so in such a way that had no coercion. Um, we will have a lot more older people. Uh, that many people consider a showstopper. I, I think it comes no matter what. The, 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 the number of older people is getting bigger no matter how you look at it. It's more extreme if, the, if you're below replacement level. But world, older people have to be put to work. Then you'll, have, you'll be okay. You want me to call on Mike? Take whatever you want. Right, yeah. Yes. I think we must figure out how to say this. We must figure out how to say that the science is not settled and not have that mean we have no business doing anything until it is. The science is not settled means to, to me we could be, it could be a lot worse than we are now expecting it to be. This is about feedbacks. They're either positive or they're negative. We don't know about several of the most important feedbacks in enough detail to say the science is settled. But that same statement is, we better be very careful, because this planet we are poking, the, Wally Broker says, poking the angry beast as an image, with a little picture of a dragon and a, and a pitchfork. Um, we, we, that's what the science incompleteness is telling us. We need to work much harder to rule out or to discover they're heading, we're heading toward these extreme, of, these extreme positive kick, kick, kickings in of feedback that could make things even worse than we imagine. It, it does not follow from not knowing everything that there's nothing to do, no reason to do anything. But we make that jump. I don't know why, how we can make that stop. It's, it's ludicrous. But it's, I mean, it's a good question because we really do have that problem with the sentence, the science isn't settled. Steve Coonan wrote that in the Wall Street Journal a year ago. He said, well, he's telling people there's no problem. No, it's really right. Uh, you, Master. Uh, when you were talking about nuclear energy, it seems to me that you are talking about actual technology using uranium. But how do you stand with respect to all this research that um, on plutonium reactors, for instance, that does not need for generation or even nuclear? I don't think there's a, uh, a single nuclear technology that doesn't at least raise the, raise the prospect of diverting it to nuclear weapons including fusion, but fusion is much more indirect. It, 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 it takes more subterfuge to make it turn, turn a nuclear fusion program into a nuclear weapon, but it, it's there. Um, and most of the technologies I, I'm aware of that do other things with plutonium and the current fuel cycle are not much better. You really need international supervision and a commitment that nuclear weapons are not where anybody's trying to get in the first place. So we, we just are heading in the we've made nuclear weapons attractive again. I can't hardly believe it in the last 20 years. Read Ellsberg's book. It'll scare the living daylights out of you. Yeah. Rob, your horses were written mostly by large industrials, the uh, uh, nuclear industry or the coal industry or the gas industry. I'm wondering if you see a place, one of those horses being ridden by a uh, large population, uh, social change or individual choice whether it's diet or something else. Uh, things that lots and lots of people so, make a decision on, not some industry capital. Yeah, you're absolutely right that one of our, one of Steve's and my wedges was driving less. And um, I didn't put, it, didn't put a circle around that one. It, it would be somewhere in the middle. I think it, it's not an issue that's fallen away. Diet was is more prominent. Yeah, and we could have five or six lifestyle horses. I agree. Um, you talked about, obviously, the connection between use of nuclear energy and nuclear, and nuclear weapon proliferation, but there are currently, I think, nine countries that have nuclear weapons, and we've all sort of established that, or Israel's a little iffy, but um, 
do you think that you know the United States could hypothetically open more nuclear plants without having that high of a risk of a decrease in the nuclear weapons stockpile if we already have one? Do you think that there is any value in the countries already in the nuclear club um, switching over to more nuclear power anyway? You're describing a, a two-tier world, which was called, what were the phrase? I can't remember just now. Under the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, there was a, a attempt to establish a two-tier world where there were one set of rules for countries that have nuclear weapons as far as nuclear power is concerned, and another set of rules for the rest of them. This all got played out with the United Arab Emirates uh, pol uh, plan. They, wouldn't, they would accept all kinds of limits at the rest of the world. It was extremely unpopular. I remember going to, talking to people in India. What do you feel about this? Are we users, users or suppliers? I think that was with a pair of words. He said, I don't know. He said, well, how do you feel about it in principle, this organization of the world? Tell me which we are first, and then I'll tell you, says they say to me. So um, I just think it doesn't work. I mean, this, this issue has been brought up in other technologies, too. The idea that some people can have X and the other people can't is, is uh, the only way I know of turning that around is saying, there's no reason why the U.S. can't internationalize its fuel cycle. And then, at least for the civilian part of the, of the technology, and then separately move the whole world, which I wish I felt more positive about it, toward uh, renouncing nuclear weapons and making, them, making sure that taboo doesn't get lost. If our job over the last 50 years was to avoid nuclear war, unfortunately, it's still the job of the people 50 years younger than me in this room to go another 50 years that way, and now to deal with climate change as well, which was certainly not on the charge that our generation was given. Yeah, Elka. So what do you think we can do in terms of uh, regulation or industrial <coughs> policy to drive us more towards the benevolent part of the civilian space? That how do we, how, Elka says, how do we use, I'm going to repeat it. How do we use, um, what can we do to drive policy toward the benevolent, toward a benevolent outcome? I'm starting with, we need a better conversation. Where we're not hiding so much from each other. We're, not will we're willing to say the science is unsettled. We're willing to say solutions are dangerous. Um, and, and then we get, a, we, we get, first thing I think is to diffuse this, tox counter the toxicity of the current argument. There's absolutely no reason why climate change is blue and not red. It makes absolutely no sense. We've, got, we've done something wrong. We being the people who are on the blue side. We've talked about it in the wrong way. We have to take responsibility, at least I will, until I can figure out why I'm not, why I'm off the hook. And then when it comes to legislation, one thing I could get into is a carbon <coughs> price. I, I don't really want to go there because I think, but I think in fact it was a misguided priority because it creates losers immediately, whereas going at, picking winners actually does work. And the solar and, and wind story is a story of picking winners, not of a carbon price. I think we have to go back and think about that a lot. That's likely to generate some conversation in the room. I know there's some economists here. It's a sobering re uh, result. I don't see how you can read it any other way. Maybe we were lucky because we did, could have picked stupid horses, and we, we didn't. Yeah? Well, the environmental community switched from global warming to climate change a long time ago and was thought to be some kind of retreat. It's just a better description. In fact, my favorite is, is John Holdren's global weirding. Um, but it's, it is a silly argument. I just would leave it at that. Barry? Thank you. Um, I think one of the truths you left out uh, is essentially the climate has always been a variable. And if you look through ice flows and historical data, you find very big fluctuations in the climate. And we've just been lucky. Most of us have developed uh, historically in a period where it's been relatively quiet. When I was younger than I am now, people were saying, we're going to go into an ice age. And clearly, that's not particularly the truth. Uh, but you're worrying, telling us we should worry about global warming. If we have a choice between those two directions, 
which do you think would be the least desirable from the viewpoint of humanity? If, I mean, if we have geoengineering, we will, we will have the choice of choosing our temperature. No, no, I, I, so I think your question is, how, what temperature would we choose? Well, no, I'm asking you to make the extreme choice. We have an ice age, Antarctica well, we, we, and Arctic come to where they were, where no, it was I mean, but, but that's ice not, ended, and then now we have global warming, and we're trying well, to um, the ice away. So which of those... No, I, I just, I don't see that, I don't see that that's, we are a modern species. We don't have any reason to go to either extreme. We don't have what? We, are mod we don't have any reason to go to any likelihood of going to either extreme unless we totally lose our, our society and go into a dark ages. We can control. We will not go into a deep... I mean, you can try to tell me that in 20,000 years we we're heading for a deep... What? No, no, I, I just don't think it's a real question. But I do want to emphasize that I wrote here and many comparable ones. There are lots more truths than these 12 that I one of which I had to, would have took out was population, and others on poverty. There are many of these, and you all can list many I wouldn't think of. Actually, I don't understand your question. Well, you have two choices. You either get hot or you get cold. I just don't understand where that choice You're comes up. You're saying that we don't need to do okay. either of those right. things. No, we don't. And I don't see why you can't understand that simple I, 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 I'm stupid. Other people? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, say it again. Which, which extent can these uh, horses, which are run by, uh, uh, by strong industries, uh, can succeed without government backing? Well, the government backing is really important for all of the, for the horse race. It's a handicapped horse race. So, yeah, I mean, but government backing in turn relates to, to public opinion. Nuclear was backed by government in a big way in, in the United States in the last decade, and it's, and it's flubbed the opportunity. So it's not just the policies, but policies. Trump is trying to recarbonize America right now. He'll succeed a little bit. But the reason he won't succeed more is that there are a lot of other factors than what the government can do, including the availability of natural gas, the, the, all the learning that's occurred before he was elected in wind and solar, and, and, and the increasingly strong case to do something about climate change. They're all, and the rest of the world, paying us no attention. So these are all things that are going to slow down what any particular government can do. People worried about everybody imitating the United States in the Paris process. That's not happened. Well, what about risk-taking and investments? Yeah. I go on to just a couple other questions. Yeah. Maybe two more questions. J Jane, and then there, and we're done. Um, I'm curious what your opinion is on to what extent decreasing the error bar on climate change uncertainty would energize efforts to combat Jane, Jane, yes, I do. Jane's question is a really important one. Um, I'm making a major point of dealing with the tails. And Jane is saying... I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. So Jane is asking, how important is it to reduce the tails? How much will that re-energize uh, climate concern or something? Well, first of all, it's possible that when you try to reduce, to, to shrink the upper tail, you discover you can't, that the climate actually is that very dangerous, Steve Pacala's word is twitchy, place. And then we got, then, that certainly will energize people, because now we, we've shifted the, the expectation. If we can remove that high, high tail and say it's just, we can rule it out, here's what would have to be true and it isn't, and I think we might work less hard, but appropriately less hard, on the climate change problem. And then the last one was here.
class that has to start at 1.30, so yeah. give, a, give a 30 second answer. Yeah. Yeah, so one, I think one of the questions you're, behind your question is what do we mean by truth we must tell ourselves? Who are we? And one answer is we're all, of Earth, we're all Earthlings. Another is we're an environmental ins insurgency. And there's some of each in my talk. I, okay, uh, sorry, but I didn't realize that there's a class that starts here at 1.30. So please clean up after yourselves and please thank Rob again.